Instagram.com. You've got COVID-19 and you want to avoid hospitalization. What do you do? Welcome to another COVID-19 update. What we're going to talk about today is how to avoid hospitalization using monoclonal antibodies. Now, we've talked a lot in the past about how to avoid hospitalization by doing a number of other things in our very popular 10 tips where we talk about hydrotherapy, we talk about supplements, we talk about all of those other things, including vitamin D. But today I want to talk about monoclonal antibodies because the environment has changed with the Omicron variant. So before we can talk about monoclonal antibodies, we've got to talk about how the virus infects human cells. Here we have the cell membrane, and here we have the nucleus. And here's the SARS-CoV-2 virus. And it has, of course, the spike proteins. Now, we know very well that the spike protein on the virus interacts with the ACE2 receptor. The purpose of monoclonal antibodies is to block off that spike protein so that it doesn't have a chance to interact with this ACE2 receptor and therefore come into the cell. When the antibodies completely surround the virus by binding to the spike protein, this prevents the virus from entering the cell. This is known as neutralizing antibodies. And you have to understand that these antibodies have to be made in a particular way so that they conform to the very specific conformation of that spike protein. If there is a change in the spike protein, it's possible that these neutralizing antibodies will not bind as well and in fact will not neutralize. So studies have shown that if we can infuse monoclonal antibodies in patients who are SARS-CoV-2 positive and have had symptoms for less than 10 days, and they're not sick enough to require hospitalization for their COVID-19, and they are at risk for progression to hospitalization, that the infusion of these medicines can actually prevent hospitalization and death in these subset of patients. So up to this point, there have been three monoclonal antibody infusions that have been given emergency use authorization from the FDA to be used in just these type of patients. Let's talk about them now. So the three monoclonal antibodies are banlinivimab and etisevimab by Lilly, casarivimab and imdevimab by Regeneron, and citrovimab by GSK. And I have no financial disclosures with any of these companies. And this word MAB is referring to a monoclonal antibody. In this case, there are two in the banlinivimab and etisevimab product. There are two in the Regeneron product, the casarivimab and indevimab. But there's only one in the citrovimab. And the basis for the FDA emergency use authorization was the phase three trials of these three different monoclonal antibodies, which I'll review here briefly but I'll also put a link in the description below to the more detailed information on those trials. So the endpoint in all of this were hospitalizations and deaths. And for the banlinivimab and the etisevimab, the absolute risk reduction was 5%. That means between the intervention arm and the placebo, in the intervention arm, overall, there was 5% less hospitalizations and deaths. However, the relative risk reduction, so if you compare those two arms to each other, that would amount to about an 87% reduction in hospitalizations and deaths. If you want to figure out the number needed to treat, as we talked about many times before, it's simply the reciprocal of the absolute risk reduction. And so in this case, since it's 5%, the number needed to treat would be 20, since 5 goes into 100 20 times. That means if you were to treat 20 people with this medication, you would be able to prevent one death or hospitalization. And in this industry, 20 is actually a pretty good number. The number of participants in that study was 1,035. If we look at the Regeneron product, the casarivimab and the imdevimab, the absolute risk reduction in that trial was 3.3%. The relative risk reduction was 71%, and therefore the number needed to treat, which is simply 100 divided by 3.3, was 30. And the number of subjects in that trial was 2,696. 
For the GlaxoSmithKline candidate Sotrovimab, the Phase 3 trials showed that there was an absolute risk reduction in hospitalization or death by 6%. The relative risk reduction, if you were to compare the intervention arm with the placebo arm, was 85%. And the number needed to treat was 17 And I'll just remind you that the number needed to treat, the lower the number, the more powerful the intervention. The number of subjects in this study was 583. A couple things that you should understand. These trials were done before the emergence of these variants of concern. And of course, at this time, with the emergence of the Omicron variant, in which there are significant changes in the spike protein, it would be very important to understand how those changes in the Omicron variant would affect the efficacy of these monoclonal antibodies. Well, as it turns out, the short of it is, is that the first two products, the banlanivimab, the atisevimab, the casarivimab, and the endevimab from Lilly and Regeneron really don't provide significant benefit or efficacy against the Omicron variant. However, according to this non-peer-reviewed preprint, they were able to show that VIR7831, which is Sotrovimab, was able to neutralize the Omicron variant with very little difficulty. As you can see, according to this graph, there is a less than 10-fold titer to be able to have the same neutralization percentage. In other words, it only took a slightly higher amount of antibodies to neutralize the Omicron variant. So at the beginning, we said that if you wanted to avoid hospitalization and use monoclonal antibodies, the criteria was number one, you had to be SARS-CoV-2 positive. Number two, you had to be less than 10 days of symptoms. Number three, you had to have mild or moderate symptoms that didn't require hospitalization. And finally, number four, you had to have some sort of a risk factor that would lead you to progression of the disease. This has been given approval for anyone 12 years of age or older, but there are some risk factors that could go towards the fourth criteria that we talked about. And some of those would be greater than 65 years of age, or it could be having a BMI of greater than 25. That's actually not that high of a boundary. Or if 12 to 17 years of age be in the 85th percentile for BMI. Another big category would be pregnancy. We know that pregnancy itself confers about a two to three-fold times risk of progression towards hospitalization or severe disease. Some of these others are not too foreign to us. We know about chronic kidney disease being a risk factor, diabetes, immunosuppressive disease, cardiovascular disease, chronic lung disease, sickle cell disease, neurodevelopmental disorders and having a medical-related technological dependence. For example, if they have tracheostomies or gastrostomy tubes or they're on positive pressure ventilation. Remember also that other types of medications like oral medications like Paxlovid and Molnupiravir, which we've talked about in other videos as well, are also available in this type of category where you've been diagnosed and you have potential progression toward hospitalization. How can you prevent that? Remember though, for the monoclonal antibodies, the window period is about 10 days, but for some of those other medications, for instance, Paclovid is only five days. So you have to keep this in mind. The other point to remember is that there is going to be a substantial shortage of all of these medical interventions. And so I highly recommend that you watch our 10 tips on how to prevent hospitalization. We have the link here below and realize that there are a lot of things that you can do that will enhance your immune system and hopefully tackle the Omicron variant. Things we've talked about before and we talk about in that video such as hydrotherapy, such as nutritional supplements. We here at medcram.com believe in giving you as much information as possible for you to make educated decisions and choices. So thanks for joining us.